So I'm going to take you back from where I started. I um, originally am from Grenada, born and grew up in Grenada. My ancestors came from India, Africa, and Scotland. So my granddad is a Dixon in um, Scotland. My uh, mom's side came from India, and my dad's side came from India. Hence why the name Bihari, the name came from Bihar in India. Um, as I said, I born and grew up in Grenada. Life was pretty tough. My dad, well, I personally think he's an alcoholic. He don't think so. My mom is partially disabled, so he was pretty rough bringing up eight kids with an alcoholic dad and really not much to give us. Um, life was tough. We didn't have anything. My first pair of trainers, I had it when I was eight years old, after I was adopted. And at eight years old, I had my first Thai car as well. So life at eight years old was pretty good from there on. But I was still a, a little rebel because life before that, I really didn't have anything. So now I had it all. It really didn't mean as much to me because my brothers and sisters didn't have what I had at the time. So I continue life as normal. At the age of 14, I decided I didn't want to live with my adopted family anymore. And I went back to my parents. And the reason why I left my parents at the age of four is because of my dad problem. And I was moving around different family member until I was adopted. But at 14, I wanted the freedom to be a teenager. And the family I was living with was a bit like the military. It was a bit too strict. So the only way to get away was to go back to my parents. When I went back to my parents, I started now standing up to my dad and we didn't get on very well. So from there, I went back again to where I started, square one, to my grandmother. At that point, she was a bit too old to look after me. So at 14, I had to leave school and go and do apprenticeship in mechanic to look after myself and my grandmother. I did that for a while, then I moved on into building. I did that for up to 19 years old. And I decided I wanted to see something else, travel the world, you know, experience something beyond Grenada. I decided to come to England. The, the reason why I decided to come to England because I've got loads of family here and I just think it was the best place to go. I was going to get help. I was going to be looked after. I arrived here on, on the 6th of August, 1999 in Gatwick. And as soon as I walk out of the plane, I get wet. So I turn around to my cousin and I said to him, someone just wet me. And he said to me, no, 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 no one didn't wet you. I said, trust me, someone just wet me with ice water. He said, that's rain. You better get used to it. Well, honestly, I'm still trying to get used to it because where I came from in Grenada, if you get wet, within 15 minutes, you'll be dry because the rainwater is warm. The, the temperature is pretty hot. In this country, you get wet. 15 years, you're still wet. You, you don't get dry. So I had to get used to that and make it worse. I end up joining the military. So I've been wet for the whole 20 years of my military career. Um, I came to England, my, my five weeks holiday was amazing. But instead of going back to Grenada after my holiday, I went to college. So I become a student and I went to college and did maths and English. I know my English is not spot on, but don't blame me where I came from. We don't speak proper English, we speak broken English. So I, I didn't get very far with the English. I didn't finish the, um, the course because I started working and I was working at the time at 19 years old, I was working for really good money. I was working for 5,000 pounds a month, doing building, working from nine to nine. And I find that was more interesting than going into college. And life really started for me at that point. I started partying, I started drinking, I started smoking. I was involved in drugs, I was selling drugs. We was trafficking weapons, we was trafficking drugs. And one day, 
after months of not speaking to my grandmother, she, I managed to get her on the phone because she was walking past my mom. And when I was speaking to my mom, she said you, to me, your grand is here. And I said, can I have a word with her? So I spoke to her and she said to me, she haven't had anything to eat properly for months. And that, even saying that now, I get goosebumps. And that came to me and it reminded me of where I came from and what it feel like to be there with no food to eat, no meat to eat, and just having to eat whatever is available. And I had a lot of money because of the lifestyle I had. But I couldn't take that money and send it to her because of I knew where the money come from. I knew how she grew me up. I know she's a church lady. So it, it would be difficult for me to take that money and send it to her. And at that point, I said to myself, I need to stop what I'm doing. Because what she would think of me knowing the life I'm living now and the way she grew me up. And that was the decision time. That was the crossroad where I decided, right, I'm going to give up the street life and I'm going to do something positive. But I didn't have no direction. I didn't know where to go. I wanted to get away from my friends, but I didn't have any way to go to hide away from them. I didn't want to go back to Grenada because I was giving up too much in this country. And one day on the way to work in um, Oxford Street on the train, I saw the advert in the paper, saw the military, and I decided, right, I'm going to join the military. Well, if it was that easy, as I said it, it would have been good. So I made an appointment, I went to the recruiting office, and as soon as they look at me, they refused me. They asked me one question, do you smoke? And I said, yes, because four weeks ago, I, was, I used to. And they said to me, well, it's a good thing you didn't lie to me because one, the way you dress, them time I had dreadlocks, big t-shirt, big jeans, big gold chain, marijuana leaf edge ring, and I was really cool. So they, they was not looking for people like me in the military. So straight away, they said to me, I'm sorry, you know, we, we cannot accept you. But my friends had told me the military was racist. So there was a white man telling me as a black person, I cannot join the military. And I, I don't like to tell you, I let him know exactly how I felt about him. And then I left. Not knowing that he refused me because of the lifestyle I was living. I didn't care about that. I was just scared about my friends told me the military was racist. He refused me, so that's it. He was racist. I tried about five times, keep going back, and eventually I was accepted. I went to training, to selection. I did so well in selection. They actually used me to make part of the recruiting video for the British Army. So from there, I went into training. Training was mentally and physically, I was ready. And I went in, it was pretty easy. But the hardest part for me was the discipline. I didn't know the level of discipline the military had because I, didn't, I don't come from a military background. I'm the first member of my family to ever join the military. I've got no military background whatsoever. So, out of 68 of us, 14 made it, and I was one of the 14. And that was the proudest day of my life. I went on, I served in Kosovo. I came back from Kosovo, I served in, in uh, Northern Ireland. I came back from Northern Ireland, and after about eight months, I deployed to Iraq. So for the first three and a half years of my military career, I did Kosovo, Northern Ireland, and Iraq, back to back, six months apiece. Iraq, we was told that it was going to be different. I didn't believe the commanding officer because all the tours I've done before, they were similar. But when I arrived in Iraq, whilst we was climatizing, I could hear all the explosion, all the gunshot. <coughs> Sorry. And I said to myself, I wanted to go straight into it. <coughs> Sorry. So after two weeks climatizing, we drive from camp 
um, Shaiba to Camp Abu Naji. On the way there, we get martyred, we get RPG, all wrongs you could think about. On the way, it was happening. <coughs> oh, sorry, I think I've got a bit of Iraq in my throat. Um, arriving in camp, and camp was pretty rough. We was living in ISO container. And straight away, they said to us, we need to move out of it. And what they, they did, they did a, they dig a big trench, 12 feet under the ground. They put a container in it, and they cover it six feet with a trench to go inside it with shells. And that is where we was living. Because we had the Iraqis walking in camp at the time, doing the, the washing and the, the cleaning and the cooking. But every day you could hear the mutterings coming in. You could hear that. But he always dropped shots. And the next day you will get a bit closer. And the next day you will get a bit closer. One day we was in the cookhouse having lunch and the cookhouse got blown up. Then the administrative office get blown up. And until they get rid of the Iraqis in camp, that threat kind of go away. But there is a, there's a few incidents like that will happen, but the two big one is the 1st of May and 11th of June. And it's a pretty short time on the ground, but it's pretty long to explain what happened. So I'm going to tell you in a short version exactly what happened on the two incidents. One, of it, I could remember every second of the way. But that's the only memory I have. After that, there's a six weeks gap. I've got no memory to the next incident where I saved 12 more soldiers. And I have no memory of saving them. But I'm going to tell you what I know and what I've been told about it. So what happened? On the 1st of May 2004, I was on QRF. Quick reaction force, for those who don't know. Um, the, the boss said to us, to go out on patrol with four warriors was pretty aggressive. So he wanted to take a softer approach by leaving the warriors behind and go on foot. So what he did, he sent out a different platoon on foot, but he knew that was pretty risky. So he said to us on QRF, quick reaction force, that we're gonna follow them out in case anything happened that we will react quicker because they're on foot. So we went out, they are ahead of us, we behind them. We carry our vehicle checkpoint for seven minutes just to make up time and we're not a sitting target. And within that seven minutes, after seven minutes, we had the call that two soldiers been shot. And we were tasked to go in to get the casualty and redraw from the, the firefight. We was given a proven route to get in. I was leading the convoy of five vehicles. Originally it's four, but we had the medic with us, so there was five. And on the way in, I came to a roadblock. Very small obstacle. I mean, I could have drive over it. But I knew at the time, Iraq was pretty hostile. They was using fishing line across the road with grenade hanging. So when the antenna of the warrior hit the fishing line, he would pull the pin and blow the head off. Uh, they know we're standing in the Tarek. So any little obstacle, we are always aware of, of it. So I never go forward. So I stopped the vehicle shot because I knew the vibration could set it off as well, if it's an IED. And I said to the bus, I'm not driving over it. He said to me, okay, that's fine. So he said to me, on the, on the left of me, there's an alternative route which is going to take me back onto the proven route. I advance. As soon as I advance onto the left, I heard a big explosion. I didn't see where he come from. I just heard it. So I called out to the boss and I said, boss, boss, what happening? I didn't get any response. So what I did, I moved forward 10 meters, five to 10 meters, just in case that the enemy was shooting at us. I'm not in the line of fire. Then it happened again. And every time it happened, it happened about eight times. I called out to the boss and I didn't get any response. And at that point, the last time I came up to a piece of brick, huge wall in front of me was blocking the road. I couldn't see properly so because my tunnel was full of smoke. So I opened the hatch in the umbrella position just over my head. And 
when I did that, I see the wall clearly. But to the right of me, I saw the, the route where I was going to go out of the, the situation I was in. But there's a crane blocking that route. And at that point, I said, I'm not going to die. I'm going to save myself. So I opened the hatch fully. And as I was about to leave the vehicle, the warrior, he came to me. I was leaving seven soldiers to die in the vehicle. Sorry. So I decided I'm going to stay with them. I'm not going to leave them. I sit back down in the driver's seat. I put my hatch in umbrella position and I try moving forward into the wall because I know I could drive through the wall. But when I realized the vehicle was losing power and I couldn't drive through the wall, I move over to the, to the right of the wall and I push it and had enough space to drive through. So I open it as a doorway and as, as soon as I start driving through, I saw anti-tank mine in my right in the entrance where I have to go through. I can't tell you what I said, but I said to myself, I don't need this right now. And a bit more. But what I, what I did, I put the mine as a 50-50 because the enemy was still shooting at us and that was 100%. But the only way the 50-50 could have worked I had to set it off. I had to set it off. So what I did now, I moved back the vehicle over to the left, just slightly, and I put the engine over the mine, knowing that when the mine blow up, the engine gonna take the blast. Although I'm sitting next to the engine, I knew I was gonna die, but it was the only way I could have cleared the route to get to the casualty, for the guys to carry on and get to the casualty. But the way I place the vehicle, that if in case I die, they could carry on, carry, pick up all the, the guys in my vehicle and carry on to the, the ambush on the ground. Well, I managed to get through. Did it went off? I'm not too sure. But recently about, I think about six, seven months ago, some, the guy who was behind me, I made contact with him and he said to me, he saw my vehicle leave about six feet off the ground. So it did went off but it didn't penetrate the hole of the vehicle, which was pretty lucky. So I'm going down this huge open road. I haven't got a clue where I'm going. I turn left, I turn right. And then eventually I come to the building in Simic House. I get out of the vehicle because it was on fire and I lie down below the vehicle to take cover. At that point, I said to the, the next vehicle in front of me, that you need to tell the guys to get out of the vehicle because the vehicle is going to blow up. He said to me, okay, and he, he buttoned on back his hatch. And I knew the commander and the gunner was in the turret and I need to get them to come out because all the spare ammunition is in that vehicle. And I didn't know how I was going to get to them. So I put, I crawl out from under the vehicle, I put my rifle on my back and I climb up the front of the, the warrior and I run through the fire. And I lie down on the side of the Tarek and I lean over and I saw the boss. I touch him on his head. I said, boss, boss, are you okay? I didn't get any response and I didn't wait. I just grabbed him by his head. I pulled him up. I put him on my back. I went through the fire, carried me to safety. I came back. I get the gunner because there's an RPG that went through the driver tunnel, missed my head and blow up the gunner behind me. So he was completely burnt in his face. So I grab him, carry him down into safety. Then around the back of the vehicle, there was five guys. I carry all five of them into safety. Then I went and checked all the other vehicles and I carry all 19 soldiers in the middle of the ambush into safety. Before I went back into the burning vehicle and drive it back to camp, leading the, the rest of the company with me. But that's the last thing I remember. I passed out and I, I vaguely could remember waking up in the hospital and asking them why I'm here. Well, what happened? I was shot in my head with a 7.62. I had two, um, I had five vertebrae diffused in my lower back and I had a heat stroke. So that's why I passed out. Um, I've been told, so this is everything I'm telling you now, I've got no memory of it. I've been told because I had a heat stroke, I had to come back to the UK. But I was determined I'm not gonna leave the guys behind. I wanted to stay. 
So they allowed me to stay, but I didn't allow to go back on the ground because I had a big plaster on my head from where I was shot. But for some crazy reason, they issued me a new vehicle because the first one was blown to bits. And I went back out as normal. And on the 11th of June, again, I was on QRF, quick reaction. And the Camgay attack, we knew where the enemy was, so we went out looking for them. And I probably drive about 0.5 miles from camp. And where the guys told me, I knew exactly where it, where it happened. An RPG fire from the left. I went straight across my face and detonated six inches from my face and blew this off. But before this happened, I was shot right here. If you could see the scar there with a 7.62. I was shot in my shoulder with a 7.62 before the grenade actually hit me in my face. But by do, by, when that happened, I managed to reverse the vehicle out of the contact, saving 12 more lives. I haven't got a clue how I done it. But by doing that as well, they managed to get me out, which I went instantly in a coma. I stayed in for five weeks. And yeah, um, the, the rest is history. What really happened there after they flew my family from, from Heathrow to Kuwait, where I was on life support, to turn off the life support because the doctors give up on me. And I was looking down and I saw myself on the hospital bed. I saw my aunt, the welfare officer and the doctor in the room and something happened. I saw they lift me up from the bed and they put me in a canoe because for some reason, the hospital was on the side of the river and they sailed me into the ocean. And in the middle of the ocean, there was a building which they took me inside of it like a garage. Then they lift me off the canoe and they put me on the right hand corner in that room, massive room with loads of light beaming into it, but there's no windows. And the, the bed they put me lying on was made of nails. And I was lying there on my back on a bed of nails. But in the middle of the room, there was an object in all white, probably about waist height. And whatever it was came, glide over to me and walk over me. And at that point, I asked why this is happening. And I slowly, slowly start hearing people saying, oh, he's awake, he's awake, he's awake. They flew me back to Birmingham, where I had my operation. They opened my head completely, rebuild my complete forehead. Well, before they rebuild it, they had to clean my brain. I lost 40% of the right hand side of my brain because it was damaged so bad they couldn't remove it. They couldn't clean it, so they had to remove it. Then they had to reconstruct all this, my eye socket and my nose. So all this is titanium. But that was the easy part. I lost all my memory. I didn't know anyone. I couldn't speak. I couldn't walk. And I was in so much pain, I didn't want to be alive. It took me in a total of six years in hospital for, to really get where I am. And that don't include rehabilitation. And as I sit here speaking to you today, I still struggle at this time of the year. Is the, the flashback, the memory, the, the, um, the nightmares. I actually feel scared to go to bed because when I go to bed, the nightmares is so bad that I can't, I just, they shouting and screaming and, and sweating. So I prefer stay up whole night. Most nights I'm up because I just can't deal with this part. And you would ask me, well, why you haven't had treatment for it? I had every treatment you could possibly think about. Nothing worked. And I'm constantly in pain for the past almost 17 years now. The pain in my head is every day, every night. In my shoulder, in my back, and in my legs because I was shot in my both legs as well, which I didn't mention because I've got no memory of how I was shot in my legs and why I was shot in my legs. So I never mentioned it. So in total, I was shot five times and just to top it off, blown up once. 
So when I came back, I was doing all this charity work and I didn't believe that the money I was raising was going to charity for the cause they said. So I decided I wanted to do it myself. And I didn't know where I wanted to go, if it's military foundation or military charity or something different. But at the time, Hell for Heroes was on top of his peak. So all the attention for military, the military was getting it. So I said to myself, why don't I go back where I started? Help the people that I actually left behind to give them a start in life. And that's how Mr. Bravery come on, on board because I went to him with the concept of what I was thinking. And he probably as crazy as me because he went along with it. And we, today, what we have, the JVVC Foundation, started with my idea, sitting in Mr. Bravery kitchen, trying to discuss how we go forward. <laughs>